In the first part of this video, we talked about the storyline and the characters, so if you haven't seen that part, the link will be in the description. And now we have to talk about the graphics and the attention to detail in this game. I played this game on PS4, and even on PS4 this game looks amazing. It looks better than real life. The amount of attention to detail in this game is astounding. The snow deformation animation, the subsurface scattering effect on the ears and the noses of the characters in game, and the shrinking and expanding of the horse testicles are prime examples of the amazing attention to detail that went into the production and development of this game. The horse balls shrinking in cold is a detail that I didn't even know I needed, but thank you, Rockstar, I guess. Um, it's great. It hits a little too close to home, but it's still great. The music is also hauntingly beautiful in this game. Woody Jackson returns as the composer, and he kills it. The music in this game is phenomenal. I don't have much else to say about it other than to say it's great. It's damn near flawless. We've talked about the storyline and the characters, we've talked about the graphics and the music, but how is the gameplay? You know, the most important thing in a game. Well, the game is really fun. Rockstar has designed this gigantic, massive world that you can just lose yourself in. You can do anything. You can hunt, you can fish, you can rob people, you can kill people, you can help people, you can do anything. So there's a lot to talk about. So first, let's talk about hunting. The hunting system in this game is quite complicated. When you kill an animal, you can retrieve the pelt and sell it. The price of the pelt will depend on the quality of the pelt. It can either be poor or one star, good or two stars, or it can be perfect or three stars. You can just run around and shoot the first animal that you see with any gun that you have at the time, but chances are you're not going to get a perfect pelt. There's a science and an art to getting the perfect pelt. If you want to get the perfect pelt, first you have to go after a three star animal. Then, you have to shoot the animal in the head, which is a critical hit, and you have to do that with a very specific weapon. In this game, animals are divided into different sizes, and for each size you have to use a specific weapon. For example, for the very large animals like a grizzly bear, you have to use a sniper rifle. But for small animals like a rabbit, you have to use the varmint rifle. And for the really small animals, like squirrels, you have to use the small game arrow, which you have to manually craft. You can also use different kinds of bait to lure in different animals so you can get that perfect kill. The map also marks down the different spots where certain animals can be found, which helps a lot if you're looking to hunt a specific species of animals. You can also activate Eagle Eye to highlight any nearby animals, it enables you to track any nearby animals, and it tells you the quality of the animal you're tracking, which is extremely helpful. In this game, hunting requires skill and knowledge, especially if you're looking for a specific animal to hunt. You have to know where the animal is so you can inspect them with your binoculars from a distance so you know you're going after a three-star animal. And you need to know what weapon to use. I absolutely love the hunting in this game. I find it very therapeutic. I like it because you can't use the same strategy for every single animal. And this doesn't necessarily depend on the size of the animal either. If you want to hunt deer, it's not that difficult to do because everywhere you go there's always going to be some deer. But if you want to hunt a buck, it's going to be a lot harder because they're not as common and they get spooked a lot easier. If you're hunting a predator, that's when hunting becomes really fun. Because now not only do you have to find the animal, but now when you do find them, they're going to attack you. So it becomes a lot more exciting because it turns into a game of risk and reward. It feels a lot more satisfying killing a grizzly bear when you know your life depends on it. Hunting can be a way to make money, but it is not an efficient way. Hunting is used mostly as a way to unlock different things in the game. You can collect different pelts and bring them back to camp and give them to Pearson and he will basically turn them into different items that will give you certain benefits, like different satchels that give you increased capacity to carry certain items like tonics and provisions. Or they could just be cosmetic items that give the camp a fresh look and you get honor points for them as well. You can also sell them to the trapper and unlock different saddles for your horse that increase stamina, speed, acceleration, and health, or you can buy different clothes that keep you warm in a cold weather. You can also get food by hunting animals, and whatever food you get from them, you can either cook and eat them yourself, or you can donate them to the camp, or you can sell them to the butcher to make some more money. And that's hunting for the most part. But then there are legendary animals, and hunting them is an entirely different story. At some point in the game, you're given the legendary animals map, 
which shows you where each legendary animal is. There are a total of 16, but two of them are not included in the map, so the map shows only 14. Hunting legendary animals is just basically another thing you can do in the game. You can sell the pelts to the trapper and unlock different items, and once you do that, you can also go to the fence and unlock some perks that give you a variety of advantages, like increasing your deadeye activation time or preventing the animal pelts and carcasses from rotting on your horseback. I thoroughly enjoyed hunting all the legendary animals, I just wish it would be easier to carry more pelts and carcasses at the same time, instead of hunting one legendary animal, retrieving the pelt, going to the trapper, selling them, and then moving on to the next legendary animal. You can also go fishing in this game, and much like real life, fishing in this game is boring as fuck. It's a lot easier than real life if you know what you're doing. If you actually know how to fish, it's not that bad. It can be kind of fun. Fishing in this game is not as complicated as hunting, but it still requires skill and knowledge. You have to know your shit. There are different kinds of bait and lure. We have the river, swamp, and the lake lure, and we also have the special river, swamp, and lake lure, designed to catch larger and legendary fish. And yes, there are legendary fish as well, which you have to unlock by activating a side quest. Once you get your hands on the legendary fish that you want, you need to, no joke, mail it out at the post office and you will receive different rewards. It's not as satisfying as hunting legendary animals, but it is something to do if you're a completionist. The fishing mechanics are not as complex, but you still have to know them if you want to be able to do this efficiently. You have to cast out your line, press the right trigger to attract the fish. Once they start nibbling, you hold the right trigger to hook the fish, and then it starts to get a little tricky. You have to hold down the right stick to keep the fish from gaining line. And after it tires out, you have to pull down the line with your left analog stick and then pull up repeatedly to pull the fish towards you while simultaneously rotating the right analog stick to reel it in. Of course, there are other factors you have to pay attention to, like you can't just hold down the right analog stick every time, otherwise the line will break after the second or the third time. So you have to alternate between doing that and using the left analog stick to pull the fish towards the opposite direction that it's moving in order to keep it from gaining line. It took a little bit of time for me to get it down, but the game does a good job of explaining how to do all of this, so you're never gonna be confused. Thankfully, there isn't a whole lot riding on the fishing system, because if I had to do more fishing than what the story mode required me to do, I would probably just go insane. So it's good that they realized that most people are probably not gonna like fishing in this game, so they just kept it to a bare minimum, which is great. In this game, horses are very essential. You have to be very careful choosing your horse, because not only is it your companion for pretty much the entire game, but it is your vehicle as well, so you have to make sure to pick a good horse. All horses in this game are divided into 6 different types, 4 different handling types, and 19 different breeds. So every horse is of a specific type, handling, and breed. The game uses these three categories to shape the stats and the personality of a horse. So let's talk about the different types of horses. We have the riding horses, which include the Kentucky Saddler, the Morgan, and the Tennessee Walker. These horses have below average health, stamina, speed, and acceleration. They are by far the least superior horses in the game, but they are the most common. Then we have the war horses, which include the Andalusian, the Ardennes, the Hungarian Halfbred, the Mustang, the Dapple Dark Grey Coat of the Tennessee Walker, and the Torquemont. These horses have high health and stamina, but they have low speed and acceleration. I should also mention that each breed of horses is also divided into different coats, and each coat has slightly different set of stats, but for the most part, they don't affect the horse type, but there are two exceptions. There are two coats that have unique types and handling types that make them stand out. One of them is the Dapple Dark Grey Tennessee Walker, which I already mentioned, and the other one is the Silver Tail Buckskin American Standard Bread, and I'll get into how those two are different from the rest in just a minute. Next, we have the Workhorses, which include the American Paint, the Appaloosa, the Dutch Warm Blood, the Missouri Fox Trotter, and the Mustang. Some breeds of horses in the game are the hybrid of two different types. For example, the Mustang is both a workhorse and a warhorse, so their stats are a mixture of those two. Next, we have the Draft Horses, which include the Belgian, the Shire, and the Suffolk Punch. These horses have average health, stamina, speed, and acceleration. 
Then we have the racehorses, which include the American Standard Bred, the Missouri Foxtrotter, which is a hybrid of race and workhorse, the Nakoda, the Thoroughbred, and the Torquemon, which is a hybrid of race and war. The racehorses have high speed and acceleration, but they have low health and stamina. And last but not the least, we have the superior horses, which include only the Arabian breed. These horses have high health, stamina, speed, and acceleration, and are generally considered to be the best horses in the game. The handling types determine how agile the horses are. There are four different handling types. We have the heavy, which are slow horses that include all the draft horses. We have standard, which is the most common with average agility, which include the work horses, the war horses, and the riding horses. There is one exception in the silver tail buckskin American standard bred, which is a race horse, but has a standard handling type. Then we have the race handling type with higher agility which include all of the race horses excluding the hybrids. And we have the elite handling type with the highest agility which include the superior horses which are of the Arabian breed. So as you can tell, the horses can be a little difficult to keep up with. But my favorite horse in the game is the Missouri Foxtrotter. I think they are the best horses in the game, and a lot of people might disagree with that, saying that the Arabian horses are the best, and while the Arabian horses have the highest stats, they're very skittish, and they get flustered and annoyed very easily. They can't handle going near predators at all, and they will buck you. Also, if you want to go maximum speed with an Arabian horse, you can only do that for a little bit until they start to get frustrated and start whining and annoying you as well. And that's why I don't like the Arabian horses that much. It's because the whole appeal of them is that you can go really fast with them, but you can't go maximum speed because they get flustered. But a Missouri Foxtrotter or a Torquemon would not have that problem, so you can sacrifice a little bit of acceleration or a little bit of speed for better trainability and bravery. And that's the trade-off with the horse system. The game offers you a horse that has incredible stats, but it does come with a bit of a trade-off, so that way it doesn't make all the other horses in the game obsolete. You can also level up your bond with your horse by doing different things like feeding, patting, brushing, or simply just riding them. You can level them up all the way to level 4, and with each level your horse gains a certain ability. Their stats will improve, their whistle range will increase, and Arthur becomes even more affectionate with them. On top of that, you can equip different saddles and stirrups on your horse to boost their stats even further. One small complaint I have is that interpreting the stats on different saddles can be a little hard. It's a little confusing to read and understand because the game uses different colors and arrows and percentages to show how the saddles impact your stats, and I think they could have made it a lot easier to read and understand. Like some saddles with stirrups can be really good, but some other saddles that you get from the trapper can also be very good, and it's kind of difficult to compare them to see which one is better. It's not impossible to figure all that out, but it could have been a lot simpler. One of the biggest gripes I have with this game is that the game wants to sometimes force you to be a good guy instead of being an outlaw. You can be an outlaw during the main missions, but outside of that, not only does the game give you no incentives to be an outlaw, but it does a lot to discourage being an outlaw. The game doesn't stop you from robbing a cash register, but it makes it so difficult that the reward is just not worth the risk. If you attempt to rob a cash register, sure, you'll get a little bit of money, but every time there's gonna be a witness, the cops will show up, and they will see you 90% of the time, and before you know it, you're either dead, or you have a $1,500 bounty because you had to commit mass genocide just to get away from the law. That's fucking illegal! Same thing happens with robbing trains. The second you get on the train and start robbing people, the law will come for you. Because somehow the cops can tell that a train is getting robbed the second the robbery starts while the train is moving. Because the chief of police in Valentine is not some middle-aged guy with a history of domestic violence and an erectile dysfunction problem. No, it's freaking Bran from Game of Thrones, and he can warg into a raven and set up his version of security cameras in the Wild West. Even if you manage to rob the train success, which won't happen, unless you cheese the game, or if you manage to rob that cash register and get away with no bounty and not having to fire a single bullet, you still lose honor. Which would be fair if gaining honor wasn't so much harder than losing honor. I guess there's a life lesson here somewhere, it's much easier to be a dick than it is to be a good guy. 
I don't know. The lawmen being too brutal and start shooting you for the smallest of offenses, the bounty system being a little too unforgiving, the masks not doing much to stop the lawmen from identifying you, the witness system being way too prominent, just makes being an outlaw too much of a headache with little to no payoff. Every time you want to rob someone, there's a witness. If you rob a cash register, there's always a witness. If you talk shit to someone, they pull out a gun and shoot you and then when you defend yourself by shooting them back, there is a witness and there's obviously no due process and you're obviously always in the wrong. If you run over someone with your horse by accident, it counts as murder and obviously there's a witness. If you run too fast and somehow run into someone, they either start beating the shit out of you or the cops will come after you for disturbing the peace. Seriously, what the hell is that? So pretty much every time you do anything wrong, even if it is by accident, you will lose honor, there will be a witness, the law will be there, and the whole thing will cost you money either in the form of a bounty, or you're gonna lose some money when you surrender to the law, or die by the hands of the law. And this is another reason why I'm so thankful for how much money you make during the main missions. I mean, seriously, why is everybody always whining about how much money they need? We just need money. But we need money. Now we need money. And we can always make more money. We are going to need some money. But we need money. We need... We need... Money! You dumb fool! Money! Or we are dead! We are all... Dead! We do need money. No, we don't, Dutch. Look how much money I have. I could literally buy the entire O'Driscoll gang and turn them into cheerleaders. I'm sure Bill Williamson would love that. The witness system would be a cool system if everybody wasn't always planning on walking into the store just as I'm about to rob the register. Seriously, you can be in the store for hours. No, days. And not a single soul would ever walk in. But as soon as you pull out your gun, everybody's like, Oh well, I guess now's the time to do some shopping. Gotta get that pump action shotgun, I heard it's 40% off. And also, if you kill someone and their bodies are just lying there in the middle of the road, and someone sees the bodies without you being near the bodies, they automatically assume that it was you who killed them. And they will obviously go and tell the law, and the law will side with them no matter what. I mean, yes, I did kill those guys because they were looking at me funny, but how did you know it was me? I mean, it was me, but like, how did you know? The NPCs in this game have godlike detective skills. They don't actually need to see you commit a crime. They can smell the criminal in you. Like seriously, the other day I was just sitting here making some barbecue and then people started shooting at me. And then there was that other time when I was just feeding one of my pets and again, people started shooting at me. I just want to be a good boy, pay my taxes, press greet on everyone in town, feed my horses on time, and live a civilized life. Now, is that too much to ask? Now let's talk about the gunplay. The gunplay in this game is fantastic. It's satisfying to shoot people, the guns sound beefy as hell, the deadeye mechanic is the best human invention since Dance Dance Revolution. Everything is awesome. I mean, I could do without this seizure-inducing effect, but everything else is great. To be completely honest though, I feel like if the deadeye mechanic wasn't there, the gunfights would become kind of annoying. Deadeye is what makes the whole thing so satisfying. It makes you feel like a badass cowboy. It makes you feel really powerful, which is great. But when there's no deadeye, you're just trying to abuse the aim assist mechanic by aiming down sights, then shooting, then aiming down sights again, then shooting again, rinse and repeat. And the whole time you have to deal with this nauseating effect. Because the devs realize that you have Deadeye and you have aim assist and that there is no trade-off, so let's just shake the screen as soon as you get into a gunfight as if you're in the middle of a Jason Bourne movie. Now let's talk about the guns for a minute. There is enough variety in your arsenal so that you won't get bored, but some of the rifles are extremely similar, and some of the revolvers are very similar as well. You're not gonna feel that much of a difference when it comes to how powerful they are. Only when you switch from one type of weapon to another is when you'll see a noticeable difference. A rolling block rifle and a bolt action rifle aren't that different. They're both gonna kill everything in one shot. A double action revolver and a high roller revolver aren't that different either. There are some weapons that are just not that great, like the sawed off shotgun is kinda ass, but the game is so easy that you could just walk around with nothing but a worn out cataman revolver and you would still be able to go through horror of enemies. Speaking of enemies, they're kind of underwhelming in this game, 
and we're talking specifically about the presence of a villain or a rival gang. The game makes an effort to put these forces in the game that come after you every now and then, but their presence barely has any impact. They don't feel threatening at all. For example, in the beginning, the O'Driscolls are the enemy, so every now and then you're gonna run into them and you're gonna smoke them without breaking a sweat because you have the ability to slow down time, but they don't, so they're gonna die and you're gonna live. Then you have the Lemoyne Raiders and they're pretty much identical to the O'Driscolls. There's also Bounty Hunters and Pinkertons and they're all pretty much the same, just dudes with guns. There's not much variety in their approach, there isn't one of them that stands out as being more difficult to deal with than the other ones. They're the exact same enemy type, just in different parts of the map. But when you get to some of the later parts of the game, you start to encounter some other enemies, and these guys are entirely different. I'm talking about three different gangs, of course, and that is if you can even call them that. We have the Murphy Brood, the Skinners, and most importantly, the Night Folk. This is when Red Dead Redemption 2 goes from a wholesome cowboy simulation to a straight-up horror movie. The Murphy Brood are a group of inbred cannibalistic psychopaths. They just kill people for pleasure. They torture them, they dismember their limbs, and they do all kinds of horrific shit. There is no bottom to their evil. Then we have the Skinners, and just like the name suggests, they love to torture and skin people alive. They're kind of similar to the Murphy Brood, but the Murphy Brood are so distinct in appearance that you're never gonna confuse them. Then we have the Night Folk. The worst of them all. These creepy fucks wander around the swamps at night, they don't talk, they don't say anything, they have creepy face paint on, and sometimes, right before they attack you, they let out a loud horrifying screech. It doesn't even sound human. There is one chance encounter that made these guys the scariest gang in the game for me. It's when they ambush you and they kill your horse. That's when I started to take them seriously. Like, do whatever you want to me. Okay, that sounded wrong. What I'm trying to say is, I don't care if you murder me in the most gruesome ways, just leave my horse out of this. He's a good boy. Now let's talk about the missions. There are three different types of missions in this game. There are main missions, side missions, and chance encounters. The main missions are indicated by the yellow clouds in the map. The side missions are the white clouds, and the chance encounters are shown by a white dot on the minimap. There is also item requests, for example, you're walking through the map and Bill Williamson will stop by and say something like, Hey Morgan, can you get me some hair pomade? And Arthur is like, Sure. And then you have to get him hair pomade, and your reward for that is some honor and Bill Williamson's happiness. Now let's talk about the chance encounters, which I think are what elevate this game from a great game to a masterpiece. One of the biggest potential problems that could occur when designing a huge open world game is that because the world is so big, traveling between certain locations can become a little redundant and boring. You want to explore this world, but you may not want to keep tapping X on your controller for 45 minutes with nothing else happening in between. So in order to solve that issue, this game has implemented random encounters which are random events that happen around you, such as a dude getting his foot stuck in a bear trap or some woman asking you for a ride because her horse died and who can forget about Gavin? Gavin! With these chance encounters, you can either get involved, or sometimes you can ignore them. There are a lot of open world games that make you go from A to B with nothing happening in between to keep your interest levels up, so you're eventually gonna get bored and stop playing. So to keep you interested all the time and to keep you playing for longer periods, this game gives you something to do wherever you go, and considering how big the map is, there are a lot of different chance encounters in different parts of the map, and in different parts of the story, so there's a lot of variety as well. I guess one very small issue I have with these chance encounters is that in the beginning of the game there are so many of them that it almost becomes distracting, and towards the end of each chapter there aren't nearly as many. And sometimes they start repeating themselves, like the guy who was bitten by a snake somehow gets bitten by a snake again, and you have to suck the venom out of his leg again, which is the exact same thing you did last time, but now you're just doing it again. But that's a very small nitpick, there are so many positives to this game gameplay mechanic that the negatives, which there are barely any, cannot ever outweigh the positives. Now let's talk about the side missions. These are very similar to the main missions, except these are optional. 
There are some really memorable side missions in this game. The one with Hamish and the one with Charlotte are by far my favorites. The thing that's good about these side missions is not only the fact that they give you some extra playtime, but the stories told in some of these side missions are very entertaining. The quality of the writing is so great and consistent that it makes the side missions very memorable and extremely fun to play. Some are goofy and funny and some are gritty and dark and more realistic, but all of them are fun and entertaining. If the gameplay on some of these missions are boring, then the story will keep you captivated. The writing in this game never fails to impress. The main missions in this game are probably where most of the problems lie. And keep in mind that when I talk about the main missions, I'm talking specifically about the gameplay aspects. I'm completely ignoring the storyline because I already talked about that. The main missions in this game can be a little boring sometimes, and this is something that Rockstar has been struggling with for a very long time. They're very good at designing open world games where you have all the freedom to do whatever you want, but when it comes to designing linear missions, they have a hard time making the missions fun. And in this game, it's actually less apparent because the story is so good that it makes up for the lack of fun and variety in some of the missions. But still, most missions in this game are basically you riding with some other gang members to the yellow dot on the map, then you plan on doing something and then it all goes to shit and now there's a gunfight and you kill a whole bunch of people and you get paid a ridiculous amount of money. And the missions where that is not the case are some of the better missions in the game. Like who can forget about that one one mission where we just got drunk in a bar with Lenny and started seeing everyone as Lenny. It was hilarious and it was fun and it was that mission that sold Arthur Morgan's character to everybody. We didn't have to kill people, we didn't steal, we just got shit-faced and tended to our alcoholic tendencies, which came naturally to me. You can tell that Rockstar is struggling to strike a balance between immersion and fun. So there are a lot of instances where they have to sacrifice one to achieve the other. And sometimes they sacrifice the wrong thing but that's subjective because we don't know what the game would be like if it was the other way around. And I'll give you an example. When you're in the camp, you cannot run. You can only walk, and a lot of people, including myself, hate this. Because you want to run around and get everything done really fast, but the game just doesn't let you. You see, Rockstar in this case had to sacrifice fun for immersion. They could make it so that you'd be able to run around in the camp, but it wouldn't be realistic. Why would Arthur run inside the camp? That makes no sense, and it would break the immersion. But it's frustrating to be slowed down to that level, and there were probably some other factors involved, like they didn't want you knocking down fellow gang members by running into them, and they probably wanted to slow you down so that way you walk around and talk to different gang members and listen to the conversations they have with each other and not think of the camp as just a stopping point. There are other examples as well, like after you kill an animal and skin it, you have to sit through this skinning animation, and as good as it looks, if you're someone who hunts a lot of animals, you would appreciate the ability to skip that animation. But the game doesn't give you that option because it would break immersion. And it goes the other way around too. For example, Arthur can absorb an excessive amount of bullets before being killed, and that's not realistic, and it's not immersive. But it would be horrible if we died with three bullets, so in this case, the game sacrifices immersion for fun. During the main missions, when you're riding with somebody else and having a conversation with them, you can only go so fast, so the game basically puts a cap on your speed, and it's kind of annoying, and I understand why they did that. It's because they wanted you to sit through the entire conversation, but some of the conversations are not entirely necessary for you to sit through in order to be able to continue the story, but the game still forces you to sit through them. You can switch to the cinematic view, and that way you don't have to control your horse anymore. Your character will just go where he needs to go, but you still have to hold X for some reason. When you're in the middle of a gunfight and if you decide to loot a body, the animation will still take just as long, and that's not fun, nor immersive. If Arthur was in the middle of a gunfight and he was looting a body, it would have been better if the looting animation was faster or you could cancel out of it because if Arthur was in danger and he was getting shot at, he would stop looting the bodies or he would do it much faster. These little things that are kind of annoying become very noticeable about halfway way through the game, and they will bother you because there's a lot of them. You can only walk when you're inside the camp, you can only go at a certain speed when you're inside a town, the looting animation is too long, the skinning animation is too long, all these little problems will eventually annoy you, but they're not horrible enough to stop you from playing the game. Another gripe I have with the main missions is that the game is way too aggressive with enforcing a certain level of linearity in those missions. Now what do I mean by that? Well, the game gives you a job to do, you have a task at hand, and the game tells you how to do 
it. And when the game tells you how to do a certain task, it's not like it's giving you a hint or it's trying to help you. No, the game means you have to do it exactly the way the game tells you to do it. And if you decide to rebel against that and do your own thing, you will fail instantly. You don't have to just fail at doing what the game wants you to do, but you can also fail at how the game wants you to do it. The game constantly feels the need to hold your hand and to point at where you need to go and to make you rely on a yellow dot guiding you and babysitting you throughout the entire story. The game doesn't let you think for yourself. It doesn't respect the player's intelligence at all. The game tells you what to do and where and how to do it. And if you do anything other than what it wants you to do, you will fail the mission. If you leave the area, if you wait too long, if the law gets alerted, if Arthur gets an erection, any little dumb excuse can make you fail the mission. But in the end, the game does so well in so many different areas that those issues just don't hold it back that much. Now let's talk about the honor system. In Red Dead Redemption 2, you can do good things and earn more good boy points, or you can do bad things and get bad boy points. Being bad is being bad. It's that simple. If you murder people, if you antagonize them, if you rob them, if you do anything that is considered bad, you will lose honor. On the other hand, if you do anything good, like if you're nice to people and greet them instead of talking shit, if you help people, if you're overall a good citizen, you will gain honor. The problem is, since you're an outlaw, by your own very nature, you're not considered a good person. You're an outlaw. You rob people and kill people and society hates you. And in a game that is set in the Wild West where you play as basically a criminal, you're gonna want to do some criminal shit. But the game is so aggressive in discouraging you to do anything bad that you're pretty much left with no choice but to become an honorable cowboy. There's really no incentive for you to break the law and steal and rob trains or any of that. Because the main missions give you a lot of money, you will never have to rob anyone. And if you get high honor, you get a lot of discounts at different shops as well, so you kind of make money by being honorable too. And even if you were to rob a train to get a lot of cash, the bounty that you get by robbing a train is probably gonna be more than what you make. Same goes for robbing cash registers. But the thing is, I kinda wanna rob trains, and I wanna rob stores, and I wanna feel like an outlaw. But I can't, because there's no reason for me to do that. It's way too risky, it doesn't pay enough, and it's so easy to lose honor doing those things, and honor gives you way too many advantages that it's just not worth it. So you end up being honorable not because you wanna be a good person in the game, but because the game pushes you really hard in that direction. The dialogue and some of the cutscenes also change depending on your honor level. If you have high honor, Arthur is portrayed as more of a selfless person who will put others before himself. But if you have low honor, Arthur is portrayed more as a selfish person who only cares about money. It also impacts the ending of the story, but more so how it ends, but the outcome is still the same. Arthur still dies. If you have low honor, Arthur dies by the hands of Micah, and if you have high honor, Arthur succumbs to his tuberculosis. Even though honor does change some dialogue and it does change the ending, its impact on the story is minimal at best. Whether you're a crazy psychopath who kills everyone for fun, or you're a good Samaritan saving puppies in your spare time, it won't really matter that much. Arthur still goes through a development, so by the end he has to become a better person, and if you're playing with low honor, the story just doesn't really work that well. Because if you're a crazy psychopath all the way to the end, then why would you give a shit if John Marston lives or dies? And I guess that's one of the reasons why the game pushes you so hard to be so honorable. It provides you with so many side missions that give you a shit ton of honor, and it does that towards the end of the story on purpose just so you get that good ending. Because with low honor, that ending is just kind of hollow and it doesn't really work. But the good ending is a real tearjerker. One more small criticism I have is that gaining honor outside of doing the side missions is kind of tedious and annoying. The best way to gain honor is just going to Saint Denis and pressing greet on everybody. And Arthur will just say something like, Ah, right, mister, you have a nice penis. Oh God, no! I don't mess with this. So basically saying hi to everyone is gonna make you a better person somehow. I don't get it. You can also donate to camp and do these chores that are super slow and tedious in order to gain more honor. So gaining honor outside of the main and side missions is tedious. Overall, the honor system could have been done better, but it has its place in the game.
There's also the camp system, and it seems pretty straightforward, but the game doesn't really explain its significance, or lack thereof. The camp needs food and supplies, and whenever you're running low, you can either donate to the ledger, or go hunting and donate some food, and once you do that, this little icon on the top right hand corner of the screen goes from red to either white or yellow. So it's your job as a member of the gang to provide food and supplies. But what's gonna happen if you don't? Is everybody gonna starve to death? Are you gonna get a game over screen? Is the game gonna stop you from progressing further into the story? What's gonna happen? And the answer to that is nothing. Nothing that matters at least. Here's what's gonna happen. If you're running low on food, either Pearson or Dutch or somebody else is gonna basically stand up and give a speech and tell everybody that they need to go hunt or fish and that they need to get some food, otherwise everybody's gonna starve. But that's about it. Nothing else is gonna happen. The story is gonna keep moving forward, everybody's gonna act natural, and no one really cares. If you don't donate to the ledger, nothing of significance will happen. The only reason for you to donate to the ledger is to get those upgrades for the camp. Other than that, there is no reason for you to do that. And that's the problem with the camp system. It's very underutilized and it doesn't play that big of a part. But the thing I love about the camp is just walking through the camp and talking to everyone and listening to the different conversations the characters have with one another. When you're in the camp, the camaraderie and the friendships you have with the other characters feels so alive and it truly makes you feel like you're in a gang of outlaws and life sucks and you're probably broke and haven't eaten in days, but you keep going because this is your family and this is all you have in the world and you love this and you live for this and there's nothing that can come between you and your family. Red Dead Redemption 2 is more than just a game, it's an experience. It is beyond a shadow of a doubt one of the best games I have ever played. It's art and I think anybody that enjoys playing video games should play this game. It's something different, you don't see games like this every year. When Rockstar puts out a game, it's an event, it's exciting, and that's because they put quality before quantity. They took 8 years making this game. The performance capture alone took 5 years to do, and that's a lot longer than a movie production. Rockstar continues to push the boundaries in what you can do and accomplish in a video game, and in 10-20 years, people are still gonna look back at this game and remember all the great memories, and they're gonna remember Red Dead Redemption 2 as one of the greatest games that has ever been made. Rain down. 